This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video demonstrates techniques of percutaneous tracheostomy, including in patients who have severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, resulting from coronavirus disease 2019, or COVID-19, and require a tracheostomy. A tracheostomy is a surgically created airway that is kept open with a breathing tube or tracheostomy tube. The tube is inserted directly into the trachea through an incision in the neck. A tracheostomy can be created with the use of an open surgical technique or a percutaneous dilation technique and can take place in the operating room or at the patient's bedside. The open technique involves dissection of the anterior pretracheal tissue and insertion of a tracheostomy tube into the trachea under direct visualization. The percutaneous technique can be performed quickly and safely at the bedside with the use of a modified Seldinger technique and bronchoscopic guidance. This approach is associated with fewer bleeding complications than open tracheostomy and similar long-term morbidity. A tracheostomy should be considered in patients with acute respiratory failure who require prolonged mechanical ventilation, defined as ventilation for seven days or more, and who are expected to have a meaningful recovery. Tracheostomy decreases the need for sedation and facilitates weaning from the ventilator. Additional indications include upper airway obstruction, including vocal cord paralysis, the need for airway protection in patients with conditions such as neurologic disease or traumatic brain injury, and the need for more effective pulmonary hygiene, which includes recruitment maneuvers and methods for clearing the airways of secretions. Previous tracheostomy or other neck surgery is not a contraindication. In fact, percutaneous tracheostomy may be preferred in patients whose surgical planes have been distorted. Absolute contraindications to percutaneous tracheostomy include cervical instability, uncontrolled coagulopathy, and infection at the planned insertion site. Relative contraindications include difficult anatomy with inability to identify key landmarks, such as in patients with a short neck, morbid obesity, minimal neck extension, or tracheal deviation, and severe respiratory disease resulting in the inability to withstand periods of apnea or loss of positive pressure ventilation. Percutaneous tracheostomy procedures for patients with COVID-19 include the use of neuromuscular paralysis to minimize the cough reflex, as well as periods of apnea when the ventilatory circuit is considered to be open. The procedure requires highly specialized teams that minimize the number of personnel, as well as full personal protective equipment, or PPE. To perform a bedside tracheostomy, you will need medications for sedation and paralysis, a flexible bronchoscope, preferably a video bronchoscope, since it allows all personnel in the room to visualize the positioning of the oral endotracheal tube, a bronchoscope attachment for the ventilator, silicone lubricant to allow the bronchoscope to pass easily down the oral endotracheal tube, saline, surgical lubricant, a dissecting tool, such as tonsil forceps or curved hemostat, a tracheostomy tube and tracheostomy collar, and a percutaneous tracheostomy kit. A percutaneous tracheostomy kit generally includes a number 15 surgical scalpel blade, an introducer needle, a guide wire, a small tracheal dilator, a protective sheath, a single-stage progressive tracheal dilator, a tracheal loading trocar, and a small slip-tip syringe. The size of the tracheostomy tube selected should be appropriate for the patient. Percutaneous tracheostomy kits are designed to be used with a specialized tracheostomy tube that loads onto a dilator. In practice, however, any tracheostomy tube can be inserted in a percutaneous fashion. We use a thin, flexible tracheostomy tube because it maximizes the airway diameter while minimizing pressure on the tracheal wall. Minimizing the exposure of healthcare personnel to aerosol-generating procedures is critical when treating patients with COVID-19. To safely perform percutaneous tracheostomy, a minimum of three people must be present, the bedside surgeon, a bronchoscopist, and a respiratory therapist. Percutaneous tracheostomy is considered to be an aerosol-generating procedure. All persons in the room must be wearing PPE. Your institution's policies regarding the use of appropriate PPE during aerosol-generating procedures should be followed.
Place the patient in the supine position. Placement of a shoulder roll beneath the patient's scapula can help to extend the neck and improve exposure of the anterior neck. Make sure that the patient's head is supported by a towel or small pillow if necessary. The surgeon should be able to comfortably access the patient's neck while standing, so adjust the height of the bed as needed. Make sure that each team member is positioned to carry out the necessary procedures safely, effectively, and efficiently. The respiratory therapist should stand at the head of the patient's bed, where the therapist will have direct control of the airway and access to operating the ventilator. Position the bronchoscopist at the patient's left side, next to the bronchoscopy cart and video monitor. The surgeon should be on the patient's right side, with direct view of the bronchoscopy monitor. However, a left-handed surgeon may prefer to be on the patient's left, with the bronchoscopist on the patient's right. Palpate the patient's neck to identify key anatomical landmarks. These include the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the sternal notch. The ideal location for placement of the tracheostomy tube is between the second and third tracheal rings. Make sure to check for a high-riding and nominate artery that may overlie the area of the planned incision. An open tracheostomy should be performed instead of percutaneous tracheostomy if the patient has a high-riding and nominate artery. Before starting the procedure, perform a pre-procedure timeout to verify the patient's identity and the procedure to be performed. After the timeout, ask the patient's nurse to administer a short-acting paralytic agent and, if necessary, additional sedation. Inadequate paralysis increases the risk of inadvertent extubation when the oral endotracheal tube is being manipulated. The nurse should then step out of the room to minimize exposure, but should be immediately available and ready to enter in case assistance is needed. Sterilize and drape the anterior neck, making sure that the draping allows easy access to the oral endotracheal tube. Next, make a 2-3 to three centimeter vertical neck incision that directly overlies the trachea below the cricoid cartilage. Bluntly dissect the pretracheal tissue with a dissecting tool until the trachea is clearly palpable. In patients who require therapeutic anticoagulation or in whom there is any risk of bleeding, it may be advisable to place a purse-string suture around the tracheostomy incision with the use of a 2 proline suture. The purse-string suture is placed but not tied during this step. It will be tied for additional hemostatic control once the tracheostomy tube has been inserted. The suture is generally removed on the second postoperative day if there is no evidence of bleeding. The tracheostomy tube itself should not be sutured in. Suturing a tracheostomy tube results in skin ulceration and does not prevent inadvertent decannulation. Next, ask the respiratory therapist to induce apnea by placing the ventilator on standby. Then, disconnect the oral endotracheal tube from the ventilator circuit and attach a bronchoscope adapter to the oral endotracheal tube. Insert the bronchoscope into the adapter, reconnect the circuit, and resume ventilation. Advance the bronchoscope into the airway. Briefly survey the trachea and clear any obstructing secretions. Once all team members are ready, advance the bronchoscope into the oral endotracheal tube until the camera is aligned with the end of the tube. At that point, the respiratory therapist should again induce apnea. Next, the respiratory therapist deflates the oral endotracheal tube cuff. The respiratory therapist and the bronchoscopist together then slowly withdraw the oral endotracheal tube and bronchoscope simultaneously until the subglottic landmarks are visible. Palpation of the anterior trachea by the surgeon can facilitate identification of these landmarks. The bronchoscope is kept within the oral endotracheal tube at all times to ensure control of the airway. Precise communication and coordinated movements between the respiratory therapist and bronchoscopist are crucial to prevent accidental extubation of the patient. Once the oral endotracheal tube has been withdrawn to an appropriate location, perform the tracheostomy using the Seldinger technique. Insert the introducer needle through the anterior wall of the trachea under direct bronchoscopic visualization. The needle should be inserted at approximately the level of the second tracheal ring perpendicular to the trachea with the bevel facing down. Placement of the needle bevel in this downward position will help to direct the guide wire into the distal trachea. It is critical to avoid damaging the balloon on the oral endotracheal tube. In the event that the patient's condition becomes clinically unstable or there is difficulty performing the tracheostomy while the balloon is intact, the oral endotracheal tube is simply advanced to its original location and normal ventilation is resumed. Additional supplies or personnel can be gathered. If the balloon is compromised, so too is the ability to provide positive pressure ventilation. A new airway 
must be expeditiously established by means of either a tracheostomy or oral endotracheal intubation with an intact tube. Feed the guide wire through the needle and visualize it while advancing it distally toward the carina. Remove the needle over the wire, keeping the wire in the trachea at all times. Advance the small tracheal dilator over the wire to dilate the tract. Remove the small tracheal dilator and advance a single-stage progressive dilator over the wire with the protective sheath loaded. Remove the progressive dilator, keeping the wire and protective sheath in place. Then, insert an appropriately sized tracheostomy tube directly into the trachea over the wire and protective sheath. If using a flexible tracheostomy tube, insert the tube with the curve directed toward the patient's head. Once you visualize the tube in the patient's trachea, rotate the tube 180 degrees to its normal orientation. This prevents the tube from creating a pretracheal plane. Alternatively, a non-flexible tracheostomy tube can be loaded onto an insertion trocar and advanced over the wire and protective sheath into the trachea. Remove the protective sheath, wire, and trocar if used. Inflate the tracheostomy cuff, connect the circuit to the tracheostomy tube, and resume ventilation. The presence of end tidal carbon dioxide confirms placement in the airway. Alternatively, the bronchoscope can be reinserted through the tracheostomy tube to visually confirm placement within the airway. Once satisfactory placement is confirmed, secure the tracheostomy tube with a tracheostomy collar. If a purse string suture was placed, tie down the suture to close the skin incision around the tracheostomy. Once the patient is appropriately ventilated through the secured tracheostomy tube, the oral endotracheal tube may be removed. In the immediate postoperative period, the tracheal stoma requires regular assessment and wound management including frequent cleaning of the skin around the stoma area and changes in dressing as needed. Pulmonary hygiene, ventilator weaning, and eventual decannulation should be performed in accordance with institutional guidelines and the clinical status of the patient. Maturation of the tracheal stoma occurs after approximately seven days, after which the tracheostomy tube may be exchanged or downsized depending on the clinical needs of the patient. In patients with COVID-19, the focus of early post-procedural care is to ensure minimization of aerosol generation. Early measures include keeping the cuff inflated, using inline suctioning, and if possible, avoiding the use of humidified oxygen. If possible, deflation of the cuff, replacement of the tracheostomy tube, and initiation of a plan for decannulation should be deferred until the results of patient testing for COVID-19 are negative. Early complications after tracheostomy placement include bleeding, obstruction, and dislodgement of the tracheostomy tube. Bleeding is the most common complication, but is usually self-limited or can be controlled with the use of measures such as application of pressure. If obstruction of the tracheostomy cannot be cleared with standard suctioning techniques, or if the tube becomes dislodged, the airway should be secured through oral tracheal intubation instead of attempting to insert a new tracheostomy tube through a tract that is not yet fully matured. Late complications after tracheostomy include tracheoenominate fistula, tracheoesophageal fistula, and tracheal stenosis. The development of fistulas is a rare complication that requires surgical consultation. Percutaneous tracheostomy can be safely performed at the bedside in patients with a prolonged need for mechanical ventilation. In patients with COVID-19, this procedure can be modified to minimize aerosol generation and exposure to staph.